Today, as we are exploring this theme of memory, we hear from St. Paul in his letter to the churches in Rome. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and parent of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Once upon a time, there was a four-year-old kid with long, wavy, auburn-colored hair who liked to roam and ramble upon his grandparents' farm. He wasn't allowed to climb over or crawl under the fence and enter the barnyard or the pastures at four years old, but the yard itself was filled with magical delights. Plus, he could use the fence to climb up into the tree and overlook the barnyard. Many hours of imaginative play were spent hanging out in that tree. The kid was me. Since Sebastian has been born, I've experienced a lot of nostalgia. As I've contemplated what he will remember from his childhood, my own memories have been vivid. Much of my nostalgia has been focused on my childhood play on the farm of my Jones grandparents, swinging on the tree dangling, swinging on the tire dangling from the catalpa tree, creating new worlds in the gravel driveway, watching calves being born. And when I was older, roaming over the pastures and exploring the dark recesses of the barns. These early childhood experience of play helped to shape my imagination in lasting ways. And it's those memories which bring me comfort and joy and fill me with wonder. Well, what are your memories? You each have a piece of paper with a glittery hanger. We want you to write down some memory that is important to you. Maybe just a word or a name. Or if you want to, you can take the time to write a whole story. At the close of the service, you can bring your memory and hang it on one of these three trees behind me, which will be our memory trees. You might be able to guess that next week, that tree will be the dreaming tree. Memories. All week as I prepared worship and a sermon on this theme, I kept singing, Memories light the corners of my mind, misty water-colored memories of the way we were. Uh, Sebastian's probably tired of that song at this point. In the late summer, I read an essay by the scholar Harvey Cox entitled, The Need to Recover Celebration. In the essay, he argues that our celebrative and imaginative faculties have atrophied and that we need to recover our ability to fantasize, to dream, to dance with joy. He wrote, celebration requires a set of common memories and collective hopes. Discussion of this essay by the church staff led to our Advent theme this year, Remember and Dream. Today we focus on remembering, for our memories are the source of our dreams, our hopes. But remembering has two sides, right? We are filled with beautiful memories, especially during the holidays. Many of us experience sentimental longings for what Christmas was like in our childhood, the homemade candies, uh, grandma's special recipe, playing with our siblings and cousins, those special gifts, the building snow people, all those magical experiences of childhood. 
But the other side of memory is that there are the things that we sometimes want to and try to forget. Forgetting and remembering go hand in hand. In October, Jim Harmon and I were driving to visit LaRue Gilman's family in order to plan her funeral service. And along the way, we heard an interview with the novelist Rabbi Alamedine on All Things Considered. He was discussing his new novel, The Angel of History, which is about remembering and forgetting. Alamedine said, I actually feel that people don't remember anything anymore. I mean, it's both lovely and horrifying that we live in a culture that encourages us to forget, to keep forgetting and moving, keep forgetting and moving on. Alamedine believes that we need to remember even those things we'd like to to forget. I picked the poem Native Memory that Jim read beautifully a moment ago as a reminder that even in the midst of catastrophe, memory is vital for our story to continue. After the shocking and horrific death of Michael's mother recently, the task becomes even more important for Michael and me to tell Sebastian the stories of his Lola so that he might inherit her gifts and her virtues. Memories are turned into stories, and thus they help to create our sense of identity. They bring coherence to our wild experiences and shape who we understand ourselves to be. At the close of his letter to the Christians in Rome, St. Paul reminds them that the old stories exist for their instruction and encouragement so that they might have hope. Paul is telling us that we need to remember if we're going to be able to dream. Here's Harvey Cox again. The religious person is the one who grasps his or her own life within a larger historical and cosmic setting. One sees the self as part of a greater whole, a longer story in which one plays a part. Cox believes that the rituals of worship and celebration invite us into the story. He writes, they give us a past and a future, which is why we bother with all this holiday stuff. As Christians, we are part of an epic story rooted in an ancient past in the journeys of Abraham and Sarah and the exodus of the slaves from Egypt. Our story includes prophets and priests, poets and dancers, painters and singers, activists and statesmen, pioneers and pilgrims. We are part of God's ongoing cosmic story. And remembering ourselves as part of that story becomes our source of empowerment. That through our memories, we are empowered to dream, to hope, to celebrate. And so today, I invite you to remember your story. Once upon a time.